All right, what is going on, guys? We are, we always say live, but we're not actually live, but we're <laughs> we're ready to get going, and we got a really, really special guest actually coming on today, which we're really, really excited about, uh, Jarek Robbins, and dude, it's been awesome being able to go through and seeing a lot of your content, a lot of the things, and for those of you guys, Jarek Robbins, he's a performance coach, best-selling author, business strategist, he's been featured on TED, uh, Fast Company, Business Insider, Forbes, Huffington Post, tons of success stories, um, he's got his own book live it achieve success by living with purpose tons of high performance programs and dude i'm just i'm really excited to be jumping on with you and be able to bounce uh bounce some stuff back and forth so dude thanks for popping on with us brother very cool thank you for having me good to see you all for those of you watching (laughs) good to to the tickle your ears for those listening yeah so you got you got quite a quite a decent sized uh, portfolio from a lot of the stuff that you've been able to do over the last little while um one of the things I, I always love to see is just like where did this kind of like all start like if we were to go back from like growing up you know like did you always know like oh i'm gonna be like i'm, I'm gonna be a coach i'm gonna be working with people like this is what i was gonna do or like like how did it look like life growing up sure um so business wise or, or job wise my first job uh, wasn't anything extraordinary. I got some extraordinary results though. Um, I, I helped drop theft by over 70% within the first two weeks of working at Blockbuster Video. Wow. Apparently I scared away whatever, whatever kid was still in DVDs and games from that store. Well, it so- sounds like um, we need you to hang out in our basement right now. <laughs> there you go. I'm just saying if you had the right guy on site, people would not be trying to break yeah, in. Absolutely. So they, ha- they hired me. I was 14 years old, not old enough to work a register legally in California. So I-, I was a big kid, had my head shaved for football. I was big and mean looking, I guess. And I just walked Friday nights and Saturday nights. I would for four hours just walk up and down the aisle staring at people, <laughs> making sure no one took yeah. anything. And it worked. Theft went down dramatically. So I paid for myself for the local blockbuster video chain that was open back in the day. Um, from there, I went and worked at my family's nonprofit. And my main goal was I loved helping people. So I was like, wow, I want, I want to help people. That's, that's the goal. If I could just help people all day, things would be amazing. And so I worked there for a while. Uh, I remember I loved everything about it. We helped the homeless population. We helped the population in prison. We helped youth leadership. We helped all these amazing causes, and I really enjoyed doing it. At one point, I walked across a little courtyard area in the building, and I walked to go see a friend of mine who was running something called the coaching department. And I remember asking her, like, what do you guys do here? She's like, well, we help people all day. And I was like, how? What do you mean you help people? This is like the for-profit side. How does this work? And she was like, well, we help people in their health, their business, their emotions, their relationships, their finances. I was like, well, that's cool. And I was like, well, how much do these guys make? She's like, well, I can't show you anyone's check, but here, I'll give you some rough numbers. And she showed me the numbers. I was like, wow, that's a lot more than I make in the nonprofit (laughs) side. And that was the only part I didn't like about the nonprofit side was how much we got paid. I was like, that's, that's not cool. People in the nonprofit world should get paid way more than people in the profit world. Like they're doing such good things for humanity and society and great causes and getting paid so little for it. Like, that's not cool at all. So I, m- I remember being like, that's the only irritant I had in the nonprofit world was how much I was getting paid for what I was doing. Loved helping people, loved the causes, loved the mission, loved the, loved the work. It was all great. I just didn't like the paycheck. And so I remember I, I, I just asked, I was 18 years old. I was like, can I do this? And I think she was humoring me. She's like, oh, sure you can, pal. They're like, no, seriously, like, can I do this? <laughs> and she's like, well, you need to go through training. You need to get certified. You need to, she gave me a whole list of things. And I was like, okay. So I went through 250 hours of training. Wow. I went through ongoing training. I went through a probationary period where I got three clients to prove that I knew what I was doing and I could get them results. They only allowed me to coach specifically on things that I had personal real life experience in. I could not, I was not allowed to coach on anything else. So I coached on time management strategies and health and fitness. Only two things I coached on. And and so they paired me up with people who were looking for those two things. Um, And now for the past 16 years, I've been coaching. And I've had a one-on-one coaching practice for for all that time. I still have my one-on-one coaching practice. I take 20 clients at a time and and we work with them. Um, Did I know I always wanted to do that? I knew I liked people. I remember at one point in university, I was trying to figure out what degree I'd get. And my first thought, I had a friend of mine who was a lawyer, a mentor. He was like, you should get a law degree because you could do everything with a law degree because you know the law. I was like, okay, I guess that'd make a cool plaque on the wall. (laughs) And I remember 
you know, thinking that through and be like, well, that's a lot of money and a lot of time for a plaque on my wall. I don't know if that's the best use of all that. And so I thought that through. I'm like, no, I need to figure something else out. And so I came back to what do I love doing? I love helping people. I care about humans a lot. I think they're interesting as creatures and I, and I like analyzing and learning about them. Um, I like studying humans. So I was like, what about psychology? That'd be useful. I, I could study humans. I could study wh why people do what they do and what they do and what are the causes and what are all the origins of thought, where it's cognitive or behavioral or cognitive behavioral therapy and all the different things that make us kind of tick as humans. And I loved it. Um, a major point that, that really was interesting was in university, uh, I think two things that happened that was kind of fun. One, I remember when I got my first professor as a, as a coaching client, they signed up for coaching. They were, co they were a professor at Cornell university and they signed up for coaching with, for time management tips. And I was a student in undergrad That's awesome. <laughs> learning about psychology, teaching a professor about time management strategies. Wow. I just happened to be really good <laughs> at it. And so I was like, wow, that was an epiphany moment for me. I was like, oh my God, age doesn't matter. Like if you know what you're doing, you know what you're doing and you can help and you can get real results, but you have to deliver the result. I was like, wow, that was pretty cool. The other thing that happened, I did a trip called Semester at Sea, which I, I took a 110 day voyage around the world, complete lap around the world on a, on a ship where you study on board. And then you go into the country and learn about what you've been studying about. So cool. I studied cross-cultural psychology, um, uh, developmental psychology, human sexuality, all these things about humans. And then we'd go into the country and see them in motion. Um, and, and so we'd learn about collective, collectivist societies versus individualistic societies. Then you walk into China and go, whoa, that's really how it is. That's pretty cool. Then you get to India and you're like, oh, totally different. This is interesting. <laughs> And in, in each layer, you get to see life unfold of what you've been reading about on the ship. Um, a key moment, and then I, and I'll toss it back to y'all for a question, but a key moment that opened a lot for me was when I got to East Africa, th there was something about the spirit, something about the people, something about the aliveness, the beauty of, of the place that I was like, man, there's something calling to me here. And I remember the cities were beautiful, but the villages, the farming, the, the rural parts, there was like some real stuff going on out there. I mean, people living in like mud huts with thatch roofs. And I was like, whoa, people, that's, that's legit. That's how they do it out here. No electricity, no toilets, no running water. Like you got to walk a mile down and like pump water into a jug and drag that thing back home and boil it, you know, for, for 20 minutes and then let it cool for 30, 40, 50 minutes to finally get a glass of water. Like there's a lot that goes into just living. I was like, oh my God. I remember I came home after that trip and I was like, wow. I can't just hang out in San Diego and go to school thinking everything's okay when I know there's people who actually need help in this world and I have the ability to help them. And so I, I packed up and I flew back to Uganda and I moved into a village. It was a rural farming village. They made pineapples there. Um, used to make coffee, but someone sold them illegal pesticide from the UK and the US. It killed all their coffee, oh, man, killed their man. land. So we came in teaching organic farming techniques to show them how to retail the land and get it back uh, to flourishing. And so I spent three months living in that village, teaching organic farming, changed my life. Wow. Wow, dude. That's amazing. That's, that's, re that's really cool to see. So when you're, when you're out there like in East Africa, so they're going through and they're having to travel that far just to get clean drinking water. I don't know what this made me think of. Have you heard of like billions and change? The guy that, yeah, yep. like I love the concept there of what they're, what they're able to do. And uh, so you went and you helped them be able to go through and do organic farming. Oh, what do you got there? I seen wow. that. I seen that post. That's on. That was on Instagram, I think. I was checking that out. Yeah. Yeah. That's wow. Sweet. So there's water down here. I don't know if it's focusing. A little bit. But there's people around a little water m yeah. mill or water well. Let me see if I can zoom in. So if you want water, you gotta take your bike there and go pump it out of that well into that jerry can, and then you gotta drag that thing back to your house and boil it to have some drinking water. Wow. wow. And most people's houses, the little kid hanging outside of his house, look like that. Wow. And that's mud walls with a thatch roof. Wow. Wow. It's definitely like humbling when you're able to go and experience it. One thing, and when you go and see that, this is one thing that kind of messed me up a little bit when, when I went and I started traveling to other countries, was you look at in like Canada and the US or even Australia, um, but mostly like Canada, the U S and you look at all the things that we have and like all of the 
luxuries that we really have that most of the world doesn't have. Yet you go to a place like that that has nothing. And I don't know because I haven't been specific to that place. But whenever I've gone to countries that don't have much, yet they're some of the most happiest, most generous, like like nicest people that you've ever met ever. Yet they have nothing. Yet you come here and we have everything and everyone's miserable and upset and angry and this yeah. and uh, like it, yeah over there they're not complaining about having too much foam in their latte kind of thing you know <laughs> that's yeah. not their first so concern. the piece that i correct and the only piece i'm going to throw in there is a little correction is people say this all the time and i i we have a podcast i interview people all the time and i always hear this thing i went on a mission trip for my church i went on a volunteer opportunity i went traveling to see what it's like and when i was there i was standing in a place with people who have nothing and i'm like whoa, whoa, whoa. What don't they have? I said, do they have love? Yeah. Do they have their health? Yeah. Do they have community and support and people who care about them? Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm struggling to understand what's nothing. And, and it's a piece that we don't realize what the real important stuff is. We get caught up in all the other things, putting too much importance mm -hmm. on it because they have everything that's most important. Now, some places need access to more food or access to more water. And those are critically important. And that, that needs to be updated. But the core elements of humanity, health, love, community, faith, connection, those things they do have, which is beautiful. They just don't have an abundance of material stuff. Yeah. And, and I catch people in that phrase because it, it's a slip of our brain. Um, and, and words are so powerful. We don't realize I was, in a conference with Marianne Williamson was speaking, the, the writer, and someone stood up and said, Marianne, to be the devil's advocate. And she blurted out, does the devil really need another advocate? And the whole room went, oh. yeah. and the guy's like, well, you know what I mean. She says, no, listen to what you just said. Does the devil honestly need another advocate in this world right now? And there was just a long pause. And he's like, I guess not. He said, okay, try it again. <laughs> and the guy kind of stood there speechless for a second. Now my brain was like, wow, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, totally. <laughs> like, that caught me off guard. Didn't see it coming. Uh, it made me think for a sec. And then I thought about it. And I'm like, well, what is he really saying? To offer another perspective, yeah. would this be fair yeah. to say? That's what he was trying to say. What he let slipped was something that was advocating something that doesn't need advocation. It doesn't need to be promoted. It doesn't need strengthening. Mm. And, and so often, that's the only reason I would catch that because I used to do that too. And lots of people do it and I caught it. And I'm like, that's so not true. I live there. Oh, they have so dude, much. Thanks. And I think, I think that's what people are really saying is they have so much, even though there's not a lot of stuff yeah. there. Yeah, dude, thank you so much for catching that. And even the devil's advocate side, because like I find myself, yeah, uh, I'll, like now that and without you mentioning that, that would not have even come into my awareness. Like I would not even. Yeah, if Marianne didn't get me that day. I wouldn't have noticed wow. either. I thought that was a cool phrase. Like throw yeah. it out there, offer another yeah. opinion, but catch someone with it in motion and watch yeah. what happens. Wow. And and not to be adversarial. No, I'm not this trying is to pick perfect. Fights or be a no. dick. <laughs> I'm not trying to, you know. It, it, you are not your like I'm not yeah. doing that I'm not spell correcting <laughs> some shit here I'm just catching truth and being like hey is this yeah. true or is there is there it's just a way that we slip with language to get let something pass that we think is okay and be like no no catch it yeah. challenge it bring it wow. back make Thank it real because that's yeah because I, I would have not have because I even even the way that I phrase yeah got to be very more conscious words are extremely powerful they are we, we know that yeah. in certain aspects and now seeing it from this perspective of like the the awareness of just how we're choosing those, yeah. those simple phrases is huge too because we we totally are ad, advocates on the side of you know words are so powerful on you know making sure that you're focusing yeah. on your affirmations and you know the I am side of it yeah. just on the basics on I think that's really where it kind of starts on understanding the value of of your language and how you're having the self-talk and how you're communicating to others. Right. But I like, I like totally. that angle, man. Wow. That's, that's good. The other element to go back to, I think what you were saying, which was how is it that when you go there, people are so alive yeah. with when there's not a lot of yeah. stuff. And, and I think a couple things, one, we get so busy being busy. My wife and I, um, you know, we, when we first got married, we spent a lot of time moving 
place to place. It was interesting. It was great for our marriage because it helped us get to know each other a lot more in different situations. Um, one of the things we did is we, uh, what did we do first? Let me think. We started off, we were living in San Diego. We taught on a cruise for 15 days. No, 25 days, 10 countries. We came back to San Diego. We decided we wanted to move. We packed up all our stuff, put it in storage. We moved to Costa Rica for two and a half months and lived on the beach. Now that was an interesting experience because while we were living in Costa Rica, things slowed down to the point that when we flew back up to give a speech in Houston, her and I had like culture shock. We were walking around like, whoa, <laughs> shit's moving really fast here. And there's so much stuff everywhere. And people are like, Rah! it was crazy. Because when you live on a little tiny beach town, on like we were on the very edge of the coast and it's just like forest <laughs> this way. A little tiny town, like the dirt roads, um, you know, locals hanging out, all this stuff. It's very simple living. It's beautiful. So relaxing. And we thought we wouldn't get as much done living down there. Because things slowed down, we got more done living down there because there was no distractions. I wrote my whole book while we were down there. We redid an entire, you know, 40 something module program and refilmed it, edited it and the whole thing while we were down there. So much we got done because there was zero distractions. We were just there present. It was beautiful and relaxing. So we did that, moved back up, um, did taught on another 15 day, 10 country trip, then did a 20 day road trip from Los Angeles back to Tampa where we volunteered city to city across all the way across the country, which was a lot of fun. Um, and then when we got to Tampa, this was a big test for our relationship. That was interesting. One of my friends was like, here, why don't you stay in my guest room until you guys find a house or something? We accidentally moved into his guest room. Not we were like, we were like, okay, a week. And then we'll find a place. We'll move out. Six months later, <laughs> we're like, shit, we've kind of been here a few, a few months, huh? <laughs> So my wife and I slept on an air mattress for the first six months when we got to Tampa in our friend's house. Um, bless him for allowing us to stay at his house for six months without realizing we were there that long. Um, it's interesting. Kind of like what Tim Ferriss did to my friend Brian. Uh, I don't know if you guys ever heard the story. Tim, he was working on, I think, the four-hour work week. He, had, he went to New York, was on a rooftop party, hanging out. He met my friend Brian. They were just chatting and be, like totally just going for hours and hours and hours. Like 1.30 in the morning, they went to go leave. They went downstairs and he's like, oh, where are you staying? Like what hotel or place? And Tim's like, oh, I normally just text a friend. He's like, dude, you're going to text a friend. Do they know you're coming? He's like, nah, I'll figure something out. He's like, dude, just I have a guest room. Just stay in my guest room, bro. He's like, I don't know you, but you're cool. Like just stay in the guest room. Let yourself out in the morning. No big deal. I don't remember how long it was, but it was like eight months <laughs> later. <laughs> Brian traveled around the world, came back home, and this Tim guy was still in the other fucking room writing a book or some shit. So Tim actually worked on, mo I think, most of the book or part of the book while living in my friend's room for just That's months. Hilarious. So apparently, I'm going to take that as a good omen that if you move into a friend's guest room for over three months, something good happens in your life. <laughs> I'm not, I can't verify that's true, but I know Tim Ferriss did it. I did it. Things are working great for both of us. I think we're in the right path in life. That's awesome, man. All right. I, so I like the... And also, uh, a heads up for beware of friends who stay. I'll just stay a night or two. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Set a limit. Yeah, put a line in the sand, hey? <laughs> change the code on the door. Have it change every week. <laughs> there you go. Dude. Yeah, well, I was loving with... Because uh, I, I haven't read your book, and I'm definitely going to go and grab it off Amazon. I should probably just do that right now, actually. It is. It's, it's available on Amazon? Yeah, awesome. yeah. yeah. So uh, I like how the title was with, with uh, like how living with purpose, right? And that's something, a good slogan that I'm liking to, to focus on right now too is the live with purpose side. It's, it's kind of funny actually how it came up. I'm, I have my, my truck and you know, I, when I decided to go online and become an entrepreneur, my, my little slogan that I played with at first, it was very polarizing, was <laughs> fire your boss, right? And so it's pretty polarizing. Sometimes I get the middle finger with people screaming at me and the other time I have people laughing and waving and giving me a call, right? But obviously I'm changing that to, to live with purpose. And I'm, I'm, I'm assuming obviously the book is a lot to do with, you know, discovering that point. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but 
that was, you know, for your journey, um, really learning, you know, that you really wanted to help people and, and come to that place. And then with your traveling and going abroad, what are some, what are, what are some like kind of, uh, like those epiphany moments that you had that really helped you solidify that that was the direction you wanted to go in your life. Like, obviously it started when you were around 18 from what it sounded like, but, um, so there were certain things that all stacked yeah. up to it. So 18 working in a nonprofit. I loved people. I love to help people. Uh, I remember I was at a conference in Toronto speaking and someone I look up to in marketing was speaking there. His name is Seth Godin. Yep. If you guys heard of him. And, and he was speaking there too. And I was so excited. I'm like, oh man, I love Seth. My wife worked with them on the launch of the Victoria Secret Pink oh, campaign. Wow. So she got to work with them like at the table, working through strategy and stuff. And she loves him. She's like, oh, he's so great. So smart. Such a brilliant man. And so um, long story short, I had a, a friend of mine who worked for us for a little bit who just pestered the shit out of Seth trying to get him to come on our, our vlog show. And, and he just wrote back like, no. <laughs> and I was like, okay. So... He said no multiple times. He's like, stop asking no. And he does answer all his emails. So it was him. And so I was excited. And when I showed up, this happens a lot where my friend hosting the event was like, oh my God, you got to meet Seth. And I was like, no, 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 it's okay. Give him space. Like he definitely knows who I am. Leave him alone. Like he doesn't need me to show up in his dressing room and be like, hey, it's me. Um, so she emails? walked me directly to his dressing room, kicked open the door, was like, Seth, this is my friend, Jarek. You need to meet each other. And I was like, oh boy. And he walked out. He's like, nice to finally meet you in person. <laughs> I was like, nice to meet you too. Sorry about my friend who emailed you 27 times. He's like, no problem. <laughs> and, and we were like, he's like, anything else? And I was like, no, looking forward to hearing you speak. He's like, great. See you then. And I walked away and I was like, well, that was kind of awkward. Um, <laughs> and, 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 and lo and behold, something beautiful happened. He gave his speech at the end. He took questions. I raised my hand and I heard that his son worked for him um, in, a, in, a, in his office. I was like, oh, that's interesting. So he's, a, he's about differentiating purple cows, stand out, be unique, follow your own path. I was like, well, that's fascinating. You know, I, I fell into an industry where my family works. And I was like, well, that's fascinating. I said, well, I wonder what his advice would be on how to stand out. So I raised my hand and said, you know, I have a question. He picked me and said, you know, what advice would you give to your son about standing out and being unique if he happened to fall into a similar industry? And he looked at me and I was very specific because I knew some stuff that most people don't about the situation with him and his son. And he said, I don't think this question has to do with that. I think this question has to do with you finding your uniqueness. My brain, I was like, no, I'm pretty fucking tired. <laughs> <laughs> this is not a hidden agenda yeah. question. Like I was very clear. <laughs> what would you tell your son who works for you in this position, how to differentiate yeah. himself? <laughs> Uh, but he, he said, let me make this more useful to the room. And I said, that's fair. Um, so I'm not the only one there. So that's fair. He said, I, I think if you want to know what makes you unique and what makes you different, he said, is the fact that you care. He said, I've looked through all your stuff. I've watched you online. I was like, wow, shit, that's a compliment. Cool. <laughs> you know, one of the best marketers in the world, checking out all our stuff. You're just looking through what we're up to. And he said, there's something really unique about you. Lots of people say they care. He said, with the amount of time you sit there talking to other people and helping them for no other reason just to help them. He said, that's very unique. Lots of people say they care. He's like, I've watched you. You show up and you actually help people. That's unique. I was like, well, that's awesome. So I went home with the biggest fucking conundrum, which was, if I write, welcome to jerickrobbins.com, I care. <laughs> that sounds like some hokey bullshit if I dropped yeah. off someone's website. I wouldn't believe them if that's what their website said. I, they're like, if, if they have to tell you, I care, I'm like, bullshit, what are you really up to? <laughs> now, I was like, that's the best, hardest to apply marketing advice I've ever received. Because I don't know how to write, I care. And, and I've told that to people and they always laugh. Um, but, but part of that in my journey to figure out who I was in the world was the fact that I do care and figure out how do I make a business around caring for other humans? And so what I figured out was, um, if I just help everyone and, and, you know, that's really hard to help everyone with everything in every situation. So I got really specific on who I was really good at helping because it's different between wanting to help and being good at helping someone. Uh, like, you know, in Uganda, you have one doctor in one clinic and they're the doctor for everything. <laughs> Toothache, go see the doctor. Having a baby, see the doctor. Your leg fell off, see the doctor. <laughs> Same doctor. <laughs> I'm like, wow. 
This guy's like a dentist, an optometrist, a, a healer, a baby doctor. He's everything. And that's just because that's the resource available in the village. So trust the doctor, see what happens. Now, if, if you're in another place that has lots of options, there's a podiatrist, there's a uh, optometrist, like there's lots of doctors who specifically help in specific areas. I figured out who could I be a specialist for? Who could I really help to get phenomenal results? What I found out was 35 to 45 year old male entrepreneurs and business owners. I can help them get ridiculous results in their life. And it's not about teaching them anything. It's about holding them accountable to do what they know. And so I specialized and niche down to that. With that, I then said, okay, that's my career. Now, how do I still keep helping everybody? And so the mission of what we do, which is the bigger mission, uh, this living with purpose kind of concept is helping the people who need it most at the moment they need it with the message they need. I was like, wow, that's cool. But then I'm like, I don't know who they are, where they are, or what they need. That's tricky. But every day we push out good thoughts through all our platforms in hopes that it reaches them at the moment they need it most. The blessing is every day we receive messages from around the world. I can pull up my little instant message chat here on Instagram and I get smashed with messages from all over the world. And it's a blessing where like, I mean, it's just, oops, close, but mm -hmm. it's a lot. <laughs> and like, it keeps going. <laughs> And every day we get hit up by everybody. And the beautiful part is I have a chance to help them. And people, sometimes it's saying, hey, thanks, I really needed that. Or someone messaged me just a few minutes ago. It was, let me see if I can find it real quick. Um, it's a, like the guy wrote back, hey, I was really depressed and this helped me you know, feel better. And, and it's just the simplest little messages from people all over the world. And, and it, it's, it's awesome. Cause it's like, wow, I could help someone. Uh, the most profound or, or deep messages we get is like, I was thinking of killing myself and I, I read your book and it reminded me of my reason to keep living. Wow. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, amazing. Yeah. <laughs> like it's wow. Okay, like what chapter? I don't know. What helped? I, that, that wasn't the intention of the book. The intention of that book was capturing 10-year chunk of my life and being like, here's what really helped me. Figuring out what my ideal day would look like. When I was in Uganda, I didn't tell you, I got malaria twice. Oh, wow. And at one point, the doctor told me I had six days wow. left to live. So I was 20 years old, six days left to live. I was like, that was not the fucking plan. <laughs> Like that is, that's not where the journey is supposed to end for me. I, I imagine my life would go further than 20 years old. But at 20 years old, lying in a hospital bed, you know, needles all coming out of my arms just trying to keep me alive. I'm like, well, shit. Okay. Well, if I only had six days left to live, how would I design each day so that I know I, I really lived fully? When life gave me the opportunity, I squeezed life by the horns and really took, took a hold of it and did something with it. I loved deeply with every ounce of my soul. When someone gave me the opportunity to love them, I loved them with every ounce of my being. And I did something that mattered beyond myself. I did something that will f ripple into the universe beyond my physical presence here. I'm like, wow, I don't know. And so I started mapping out what this perfect day or ideal day would look like for me. And I tried to live it for those six days. Um, once I figured out how to turn that day into reality, because I was sick, torn up, down, overwhelmed, exhausted. I went from 215 pounds all the way down to like 180 pounds within a couple of weeks just because my body just shriveled with the malaria. It was really bad. I got really like thinned up and skinny and I felt extremely weak. Um, you know, and, and according to the doctors, I was supposed to be dead. And, and so in that process, there was lots of stuff. Some of it's science-based, some of it's pseudoscience, but I'm like, hey, when I was lying in a freaking hospital bed in Uganda, that helped. Yeah. <laughs> now, if I take that to Harvard research, they're not going to be able to prove that it's true. But I can tell you from firsthand experience, lying in a bed in Uganda, that shit helped. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so some of those things are some of the chapters of what helped. You know, flooding my mind with my vision of where I wanted to go helped because it created a compelling yeah. future, compelling vision for the future. It gave me a reason to keep trying to live. Um, pseudoscience. There's no science that says if you think about the future, it'll turn <laughs> out. <laughs> yeah. Like there's no laboratory that's going to verify that. But um, they will say mental yeah. rehearsal. 
does work in increasing performance. So that's another chapter we talk about mental rehearsal, how I not only visualized what I wanted, but then I mentally saw myself doing it again and again and again to make it feel real. And when you do that, your brain doesn't know the difference mm -hmm. between reality or the imagination. So it gives you the same pleasure response, which makes my body feel like it's succeeding, it's achieving, which is good. It kicks off all the right chemicals, which helps with healing. Yeah. And so these were things I was doing, some of them science, some of them not, but they all stacked up. So chapter one is how to identify the ideal day. Two through 11 is how to turn that one day into reality. And then chapter 12 says, okay, if you could live that one day, now let's identify your ideal life vision. So five, 10, 20 year vision for your life and take it from there. Dude. Um, and I love that. Like, <laughs> I just, I just I, got finished some of these books. And, yeah. I'm like, I I've been really into like Joe Dispenza yeah. and reading a lot of his stuff and, and a lot of the stuff that he talks about. And, 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 you know, where people are actually able to physically learn skills by imagining themselves doing the skill, like whether it's piano or even bicep, they have people put their arms in cast and imagine themselves doing bicep exercises and gaining muscle mass where most people, what happens when you have a cast, right? The muscle goes down, you lose. And so it's like, it's really cool. I'm fascinated by that, that, uh, that whole topic and subject. And yeah, they might not be able to, I, I love how. How even how Joe over he'll go like you know our thought our, our our thoughts is what trigger the choices that we make that trigger the behaviors the behavior creates the experience the experience then releases an emotional response and then we become addicted to that yeah. and whether that's good or bad and so a lot of people that say they're trying to create their perfect ideal day yet they're thinking thoughts of oh it's not working yeah, or I'm not good enough and then that releases the emotional response after of like ah oh, I don't feel very good I'm not yeah. feeling you know and now they create a perpetual yeah. cycle of that. And uh, kind of recreating a vision, recreating from the past versus taking a compelling vision of the future like you were talking about mm -hmm. and being able to create that. Yep. Now, we have a lot of people that have listened to this that that's exactly what they're trying to do right now. They're trying to get clear and create this compelling vision of the future and turn that perfect day into a reality. And I wanted to kind of tie this back in because I feel like a lot of people, especially with with your expertise in like time management, right? For some, a lot of the people that yeah, are trying to create this perfect day, they're like we teach people how to market and sell products online and affiliate marketing. And so they're trying to do this on the side. Like a lot of them, they're working at a job, you know, and then they're, then they're taking the time at home. They're trying to do this on the side to try to replace that job income. W what would you have is for like tips when it comes to like time and management for someone that's like, they're, they're trying to, they're trying to pursue something on the side now to kind of, you know, get out of the traditional nine to five working for somebody else. They're trying to create something for themselves, but they got kids, they got this, they got this going on. And they're just trying to figure out a way to be able to manage their time more effectively. Sure. Um, so I'd start, I'll give you a formula first, because you mentioned something that's important. Uh, if someone wants to feel depressed, all you got to think about is the past and something that's out of your control and something that specifically upset you. Instant depression. Uh, if you want to feel excited uh, or determined or focused, all you got to think about is the future, something that you're hopeful or excited about that you want to create and you'll feel hopeful or excited. If you want to feel happy, you just got to think about this present moment, this breath, this heartbeat, and be grateful for it. And, and so there's very simple formulas to, to bring about any of those states you just talked about. I know you mentioned some people are overwhelmed or frustrated or anxious or, or depressed, these kind of things. Um, the difference between uh, excitement or fear or anxiousness is controlled or uncontrolled imagination. So if you think of the future and you think of what you want to have happen, you get excited. If you think of the future and you think about all the shit you don't want to have happen, you get anxious, worried, tense, fearful. That's it. And it's just controlling where your imagination is focused. Because the truth is, neither are real yet. Both are imaginary. You're just creating both options. And whatever one you focus on is going to determine how you feel. So that's something important that you mentioned in the beginning of that. Um, when, it, when it comes to building, let's just call it a side gig or, or your side business for right now, just as a thought, uh, my wife put together two different ones last year. She put together an Etsy t-shirt business and bump that up to 30 grand a month within six months in consistent revenue, which was great. Then she put together an Amazon business and bumped that up to 143,000 a month within three months. And, and so when you're doing it, I looked at her and I'm like, wow, I know lots of people who have like 1500 yoga mats in their garage and that did not turn out very well for them. And they never got up to 143,000 a month. Like what the hell did she just do different that they didn't? That's interesting. And I know a lot of people who tried to get into the t-shirt business when that got big online and they didn't make that much money. They didn't make 30 grand a month. Like what, what was the difference? And when I watch it, there was a few different things that she does and I do 
um, that, that makes that difference. And the first is she has a full-time job with, with us. So she did not do the, I quit, I'm out. Who's coming with me and take the company fish to go start her side gig. So she had a full-time job running all of our marketing and ads and all that stuff. So she was working the whole day doing what her first job. And then she was doing this side business on the side. That's the first thing I've seen a lot of people who screw this up. They try to say, okay, I'm going to work half the day on my real job and half the day on my side gig. The only problem with that is if you don't give your real job enough attention, your ass will get fired. <laughs> yeah. So she gave the full day to the real job. We would spend some time together. Then she would spend some time on the side job. Then we would spend more time together. And so in that couple hours, little window at night or an hour every evening kind of stuff, what did she use the time for? The very first thing she did, you know, and I always give this example. It's how we screw up in relationships. If you walked by someone and you looked at them and got the feels and got all excited, it's usually how most relationships start. I'm like, would that make you a good pilot? Let's say you drove by the airport and you saw a Cessna 172 or, or let's get fancy, a, a Citation 10 or maybe a Gulfstream or a Boeing business jet. Like you saw that thing, you're like, man, I get the feels for that. I'm going to fly that thing. You pull into the airport, you get out of your truck, you walk in, you're like, I'm going to fly the plane. I'm going to do it. It feels right. I'm, I'm, I'm going to fly it today. Somehow you get yourself in the cockpit, you turn that thing on, you pull it out to the runway. You might be able to get that plane in the air good fucking luck at keeping it in the air and and let's see what the fuck happens when you try to <laughs> land that baby if you've never taken a lesson you've never learned you've never studied you've never researched this you've never practiced you never took you know you don't have a certificate um like if you don't have all the details to be a good pilot your plane is gonna crash and burn at some point yeah. right why in the world do we get into relationships just because we drive by the airport, see a plane and get the feels for it and say, I'm going to be a pilot today. I'm going to fly that plane. <laughs> never studied, never researched, never took a course, never had a, a, a student pilot situation where you learn from someone and went test flights and learned how to do with the proper procedures. Like there, there's a lot of shit that just seems backwards when people do that. This is also what people do when they try to start a business. They drive by an opportunity, they get the feels and they go, I'm going to be a pilot. You're like, whoa, tiger. Did you read the book on it? If you don't want to read the book, did you watch the videos? If you didn't watch the videos, did you at least get a mentor, someone who can show you the ropes and take you up on the course and fly you around in the plane and make sure you're pushing and pulling the right levers without killing yourself? Do you, did you do the hours of practice to make sure that you got yourself in position? Do you have a checklist to follow every time you try to make sure you're doing this shit correctly and not fucking up and trying to fly a plane without any fuel in it? Like the worst thing you could do is get the plane in the air and go, oops, we're out of fuel. <laughs> like that would suck. And, and so I would look at this same procedure and I looked at my wife and I said, wow, she's also working on her pilot's license. Maybe that's what made her so successful. There's a system and process she's using that's preparing her to be an incredible pilot. When she came over to any of those opportunities she got into, she figured out what the system and process was. She learned it. She studied it. She practiced it. She got a mentor. She hired a coach. She was practicing learning, practicing learning, applying, practicing learning, applying, practicing learning, applying again and again and again and again and again. And, and they were fine tuning. She had outside perspective. All this stuff that went into it made her very effective very quickly. And so the cool part, you can learn how to be a pilot and get your private pilot license in 40 hours. That's not a lot of time. I bet you could learn how to have a badass online affiliate business like you guys are doing in probably 40 hours if you really applied yourself. This next statement blew me the fuck away. He, she got in the plane with, a, with the instructor. He's like, wow, you're really studying. She looked at him and said, uh, aren't you supposed to? <laughs> he said, yeah, but most people who sign up to take pipe lessons don't usually study. Oh. Wow. I went, holy <sighs> shit. I'm now I'm going to think about I'm not going to stand under any planes. <laughs> Nowadays, I'm going to fucking, I see a plane flying. I'm going to move. <laughs> Jesus. You're not studying and your life is on the line floating mm. through the sky. Like, no thanks. I want to practice with someone who's fucking studying. So 
I think that sets her apart. She studies, she learns, she practices. Now, time management, that's not that tricky. If you look at the day, and I don't have, there, there's these great little Instagram quotes where it has the perfect little pie chart. And it's like, if you sleep eight hours, you work out for two hours, you eat this much, you work for eight hours, you know, you have approximately X hours per week left. I could comb through my Instagram and see if I could find one because there's on they're on there. But it's that process. There, there's enough hours at the left every day that if you use them effectively, you can get a lot done. You know, my wife started two businesses last year. They made a ton of money. She she moved a lot of product and enjoyed the hell out of doing it. She's very proud of those things. Um, we have a couple different companies. We, we have lots of stuff. And, and all we do is we practice optimizing outcome-focused results. So when we look at an hour of time, we ask the question, what's the outcome? What do I need to get complete? Now, if I can get that outcome met in 15 minutes, I don't need to sit there and for a whole hour. 15 minutes is done, move on to the next outcome. That saves a lot of time because a lot of people sit there for the whole hour because the calendar said it was an hour. It's like, no, that's, that's, if you got done in 15 minutes, you just wasted 45, yeah. move on. Um, there's lots of people who do this. My dad does this, Gary Vee does this. They say, hey, you got 15 minutes. And they found out most times people can sum up everything they need to say in 15 minutes. It's the most important. Every now and then it goes long, but most part it's only takes 15 minutes. They move on to the next thing and they keep their day in little 15 minute chunks and it just moves things quickly. That's if you want to be hyper productive. Uh, if you want to really enjoy things, space stuff out. Um, you know, giving time management strategies depends on the outcome of the person. If it's a lifestyle business, you're going to go slower, kind of steady eddy concept, but it's going to be less of a headache. If it's a performance-based business, you're going to go faster, but you're going to have lots more stress and headache. You know, if you want a performance-based business psychology and theory, uh, go read the book Shoe Dog. You know, he's trying to fill Nike, growing Nike. That's a performance business. He's all in, 100,000%, go, 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 go. I have clients I work with. One of them just raised... $30 million in their round B for their company. They scaled from, you know, 20 something employees to 140 employees in the last 90 wow. days. There's a lot of risk. There's yeah. a lot of shit moving. We got to hold them totally accountable and a hundred percent keep them on path because every decision matters and the decisions have to be made now. And, and you can't make mistakes. You're going to make them, but you got to mm -hmm. fix them fast and get them right back on track. I have other clients they take a really long time to get something going because they have the financial means to take their time. That's why I said, if you have a full-time job and you want lifestyle, take your damn time. Enjoy the process of building it. Enjoy learning and studying and practicing and getting to know the procedures and, and just mosey through it and enjoy the process. Nothing wrong with that. You just got to make sure that you have the systems and the resources set aside to be able to sustain it. Um, where, where lots of people go wrong is... They don't have the resources to go slow, so they try to go fast, and they also try to not have any headaches. <laughs> like, no. Oh, someone came to me one time, and they're like, hey, I want the perfect diet, the perfect meal plan. I said, okay, what are you trying to do? They said, I want to look like Arnold Schwarzenegger and run the Iron <laughs> What do I eat? <laughs> like, those are two completely different yeah. paths. <laughs> so sometimes people do that with business. I want to have stress-free living and make hundreds of millions of dollars a year. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck are you talking about? Like those two different paths. Choose one. Like you can have stress fee living and make a million, two million bucks a year, hundreds of thousands a year, stress fee living, totally. But to make hundreds of millions or billions in revenue, there's too much going on to be stress free living. Like it, it's a lot of pressure and there's too many moving parts. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> well, that's what I always wanted to be. I wanted to be like, you know, big and buff and jack like Arnold too and run around, but you kind of destroyed my dreams on that one. <laughs> yeah. It's just reality. It's okay, I'll get over it. <laughs> now, you could do one and yeah. then the other. You know, that's what I did. I, I started off with a lifestyle-based business. My goal was to get done every day by 2 p.m. I'd get done with my business at 2 o'clock and I'd go hang out on the beach with one of my best friends and we'd, we'd bike ride and I was single at the time, hang, check out girls and just hang out. We loved it. I go to yoga at five, totally stress-free living, making about a hundred, two hundred thousand a year. Loved it. It's totally relaxed. And then I got married. 
we decided we, we want to work on having kids. I was like, oh, we need a lot more resources if we're going to have a family and provide life and all that stuff I want to provide for them. It's like, oh, we need a performance-based business now. Like this can't be lifestyle, get done by two, make a couple hundred grand. It could be, but I want to give more to my family. So we swapped gears into performance. Now it's a totally different procedure. We work longer hours. We're constantly making stuff grow. We're popping up side businesses for fun. We have a bunch of different companies on the side we grow, like the ones we mentioned. And, and you know, now we make millions of dollars a year. And I was like, oh, totally different mm -hmm. path. Um, what I always show people, I, I draw this little image. Uh, let me see if I can find my little dry erase board real quick. Oh, let me erase it. I don't know what I was drawing before. <laughs> Get rid of that. I always show people, and this is really important because you got to decide what you're aiming for. Um, if you make this little chart, I say most people start right here, and we got to decide where we're going. Um, over here, I always write the 99%, which is normal average results, right? So that's not what most people want. In Canada and the U.S., if you say, do you want to be as healthy as the average person? <laughs> People <are> like, no. <laughs> okay. Do you want to be as happy as the average person? <laughs> no. Do you want to be as financially abundant as the average person? No. Well, shit. Okay. <laughs> what do you want? And most people tell you their dreams and goals and desires. And I always say most people you know, they're, they're looking for the 1%. Now I say that and people go, Oh no, they're not those greedy <laughs> bastards. I'm like, no, no, no. That's if you watch the yeah. news too much. Do you want to be the 1% of givers in your community? Do you want to be the 1% of people who have loving, passionate, beautiful relationships with your kids and your wife and your husband and your friends and your family? Do you want to be the 1% of healthy people in your community? Do you want to be the 1% of people who take care of the community more than everyone else? 1% of leaders in your community. People are like, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. 1% of the happiest people in your community. Oh, of course, of course. And then I look at their dream boards. They don't have the 1% on their dream boards. When I look at what they're actually dreaming of, they're dreaming of the 0.001%. Like the 1% in, in, at least in the U.S. is 389,000 a year in income, you know, average health, okay marriage, pretty good kids. Like that's the 1%. When I look at people's dream boards, you see like jets and mansions and vacations and building schools and underdeveloped regions and all this stuff. That is the 0.001% of humans on this planet. Yeah, the 1% of 1%. There, <laughs> correct. There is a reality check because people say, well, I would be good with the 1%. If you live on more than $5 a day, you are the 1%. that's normally like a, Oh shit. Moment for most people I've spoken to. Cause they're like, Oh fuck. What do you mean? And I'm like, no, no, you're complaining about the one fucking percent. You're writing on your thousand dollar fucking iPad or iPhone. <laughs> you, 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 you drank your $5 latte for the fucking day. You are the 1% yeah. of the planet. <laughs> and, and, and people don't like that. They like to think the greedy bankers are the 1%. I'm like, no, no, get, get a reality check. So we get that straight. And then I say, but what are you really aiming for? And we realize they're aiming for the 0.001% of health, relationships, finances, abundance, business results, all this stuff. And we go, oh, well, where are your habits? And this is the problem. Their habits are right here to the 99%. And their goal, their dreams is up here to the 0.001%. Obviously, there's a big fucking gap. <laughs> That's the problem. So when we sit down and we say, how do we effectively help them in time management? The first thing we got to figure out is what kind of results they want. If they want 99% average results, that's totally cool. The average person I know in the U S makes 30, 40,000 a year. That's what you're aiming for. That's a hell of a lot easier to get to than a million dollars a year, $10 million a year. So if you want to make 30, $40,000 a year, shit, we could help you get there. And as long as you're fucking cool with that, we are golden. High five. That's awesome. Enjoy it. It's a good amount. It's great. Now, if you're trying to make $400,000 a year, that takes a whole different set of fucking habits you got to do every day. Totally different mindset, totally different daily routines, 
totally different style and approach to what you got to do to be able to earn that amount of revenue. And someone challenged me on Facebook the other day. They're like, name a few ways. I say, how about this? Start a nonprofit. That's where my brain goes to. Start a nonprofit. Be the director of the nonprofit. Grow the hell out of it. And a director of a major nonprofit will make about 400000 a year in salary. They're like, oh. <laughs> I was like, but having a major nonprofit is not a 99% no. result. That's a one, if not yeah. 0 .001 yep. percent result. Like you gotta be a badass to run a great nonprofit. And they're like, but, but could you really make a, they, they try to argue this. And I'm like, well, mother, <laughs> mother Teresa made a big fucking difference in the world. And she had millions of dollars a month pouring into her nonprofit and zero in savings. She had faith and she had consistency in helping people in a way that poured tons of money in and allowed her to reach tons of people in the world. And she had millions of dollars of resources to do it because she was dedicated and consistent in what she was doing. So yes, you can make generate millions to be able to help people if you're dedicated and consistent and really doing something at an exceptional 0.001% level. She was not an average human. She was a 0.001% human who delivered a 0.001% level of love and effort and caring to the world. And it was recognized and supported. I was like, wow. And they're like, okay, well, what else could get you there? And I always ask the question, well, what does the world need more of? We have a podcast called What the World Needs More Of. But what does the world need more of? They're like, well, the world needs more love. Okay, we just solved that. Well, you can't make money with love. Sure the fuck can. Mother Teresa made millions of dollars leading with love. And she donated all that money to help orphanages and all kinds of people. Well, the world needs more laughter and joy. Well, Kevin fucking Hart figured that <laughs> yeah. shit out. It's working for him. He's laughing and, and causing people joy and it's working out. Well, the world needs more caring. Okay, Mother Teresa, back to her. But you go down the list of the world needs more creativity. Well, fuck, look at every artist that popped. Like, amazing. The world needs more whatever they come up with. There's always an example of someone who's made it. The difference is there's also hundreds of thousands, if not millions of examples of the one who did the same thing that didn't make it. And the difference comes back to their habits. What are the habits that absolutely gets the results that you desire? Now, I always ask people, what has to change? When you re make that realization, do you either A, have to adjust your habits to become the 0.001% kind of habits, or B, do you got to just become cool with having the 99% goal? Like Either you got to change your habits or you got to change the goal, one or the other. But you can't keep doing this and expecting this. Well, you can, but you're going to be fucking disappointed <laughs> at the end because you're going to be hoping for this, land up here and go, well, that's not what I fucking wanted. But that's what your habits get you to. So you got to make sure that whatever you want, your habits actually take you there. And that, so for time management, I would figure out what are the habits that actually get the result you want. And, you know, If you want to have a big ass business, there's a lot of habits that go into that. Hiring habits, staffing habits, outsourcing habits, systems and processes habits, um, culture and communication habits, financial management habits, uh, marketing and sales habits. There's a lot of habits that go into having big businesses like that. Um, if you want to have a lifestyle-based freedom business that also does consistently pretty good revenue, and I would say the ones my wife put together, 143000 a month, that's a lot. And she didn't have a huge team. She had one partner and a coach. So you, you can do a decent amount of, you know, a couple million bucks a year kind of stuff um, with a small team like that, that the habits that go into it have to be the right habits. And where do you learn those? Uh, I don't know if you guys teach for, for, you know, what you guys do, but you learn from people who've already done it. Go find mentors, go find coaches, read the books, study. Some of them you're going to read and you'll figure out whoever you just read was full of shit. <laughs> like, yeah, they got me. They sold me their $12 book and it was bullshit. <laughs> and oh well, I learned what not to do. Some of them you'll read, they'll be fucking fantastic. You'll be like, that was brilliant. And I don't know how I got it for fucking 12 bucks. That was a yeah. steal. <laughs> like, and then that's the truth. You know, there's lots of people who, who you'll sort them out as you go through it, but just figure out what's real and what's not. When you find someone who's the real deal, share them with your friends so that they know and they go, oh, this one's real. All my friends say they're real. Okay, they're cool. Let me check them out and make sure it works for you. But that'd be my thought. Find a good mentor, find a good coach, find someone to hold you accountable, and then commit to doing the habits that actually get the results you want. 
Dude, yeah. I think that's brilliant breaking it down in that way because yeah, I think when brilliant. you draw it out like that and re- like that just sparks so many ideas for me because it's like especially with like vision I don't teach so much on the vision board side of things um, but I see a lot of people that do them and uh, and it's exactly what you said it's the it's the private jets it's all this but when you look at the habits and that's cool when you can make the correlation and go look at the habits and you're making habits of 99% yet you're saying you want 0.001% and so then it's very clear. Either change the goal, change the habits. It's it's not fucking rocket science. Like it's it's very simple. You either move the goal down or you move your habits up. I I think that was a really right. really amazing way to put that, dude. When when you see it, I always just tell people if you have ninety nine percent habits but point zero zero one percent dreams, the math mm-hmm. doesn't work. And math, you can fight emotions and math all day long, and math math is going to win. Yeah. It's math. Yeah. It just works. <laughs> now you don't have, you should be good yeah. at math. <laughs> if it's going to work, you could be not good at math and <laughs> fuck it up. But if you're good, you know, if, if it's basic numbers, which this is, it's pretty clear. Uh, one, you need to shift one or the other. Um, you can meet them in the middle to start with and then inch it up if you want. But, but you gotta, you gotta make sure the math adds up here. So it's something I love to do with people is take your 20 year vision figure out where you want to go, break it down to 10 years, five years, one year, break it down quarterly, break it down to this month and say, okay, here's what has to happen this month. If I even want to have a chance at getting here 20 years from now. Okay, cool. I know exactly what I have to do. And the fun part is if you look at the growth curve, let me see if I could find this real quick. Um, The growth curve, Warren Buffett earning. Let me see if it pops up. I love that. I love that reverse breakdown yeah. that you were just we're talking, talking about. about those. I've, I've experienced, experienced that a few times time in actual history, history and traction. traction. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, lately, 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 it breaks it down, down like that. that. It gets, it gets to, to quarter rocks. rocks. Damn. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the fun part is when you're doing the stuff that works, eventually you get mm-hmm. exponential growth. So that's a huge <laughs> growth. The crazy part <laughs> is it took him nine years to make his first million investing in the stock market. Now, if there was a book written by Warren Buffett that says nine years is your first million, I think most people would buy it nowadays. If you erased Warren Buffett's name from it and you're walking through the bookstore and you look over and it says nine years to your first million dollars, most people would stare at that and be like, nine years? (laughs) Fuck, that's a long time. Fucking nine years, man. That's crazy. You just walk right past it. Yeah. Isn't that nuts? Yeah. Yeah. That's the truth. It took warm fucking Buffett nine years to make his first million in the stock market. And we put his name on it. Everyone would be like, well, fuck, this guy figured shit out. I'm going to buy that book. Take his name off it. Joe Awesome, nine years to your first million. People would be like, what the fuck? Nine years? What's wrong with that human? Like, they, they, there's something would be wrong with you. It's not six minutes fucking abs or some shit, you know? Five minute results. Instagram. It's what we've been trained to think about nowadays. So nine years, the fuck nine years, my God. But the truth is when you talk to people who've built businesses that are in that level consistently, not spikes and falls, but you know, million dollars a year. And usually it's revenue first and then profit kind of concept. But when you talk to them, you hear their stories. Their stories are never, <laughs> I just opened it up and bam, like, fuck it's there. I mean, even my wife, three months to 143,000. You got to remember, she spent the last decade of her life working with people like Seth Godin in marketing, launching products with Pink Mm -hmm. and Victoria's Secret. She knows what the fuck she's doing in marketing. (laughs) She knows how to use keywords. She knows how to adjust the formula. She knows how to leverage the system. And all of a sudden, pow, you get a result. But that's a decade of experience to be able to apply to this specific situation to get an incredible result. Nine years to a million. She spent nine years or 10 years of practicing to be able to produce it in a short period of time. So what people forget when they get all excited about something because they hear the someone get on stage and say, it only took me three months to 143,000 in revenue, which is true. They left out, took me 10 years of fucking practice to be able to be good enough to do that shit. But no one's going to buy the nine years of your first million book. So most people just leave that part out. <laughs> and you can name them. 
You can name any of the people that are huge names in any industry. And if you do your homework and figure out what they've really gone through, all of them have dedicated at least five, 10, 15, 20 years to their craft before they really, really popped. Now, it doesn't mean they didn't make some money along the way, but before they really popped and it was consistent, there's about five, 10, 15 years of, of effort and refinement and practice and learning and going through it. And if they're willing to put in that effort, if you're willing to buy Warren Buffett's book that says nine years to your first million and you do what it says every single fucking day, hopefully you get there faster because you get all the lessons he learned <laughs> fucking yeah. it up half the nine years. Yeah. That's the good part. You get to skip all the bad shit because you learn yeah. it from Warren. The cool part is hopefully you get there in five years because you can cut it in half because you know the strategy that works. But if you do the right habits every day, like the book says, all of a sudden you get an amazing result. And it's not a fluke where it goes up and down. It's, it's an amazing result. I have a, a, something I heard one time on a motivational tape, which was there's a reason the desks are a different size in second grade and 10th grade. You're supposed to fucking grow. <laughs> like <laughs> The desk ain't the same size. And I always look at results. And I'm like, there, there's no reason why your bank account should be the same size year to year to year. It should be bigger every year. There's no reason your health should be the same every year. It should be better every year. There's no reason your relationship should be the same as it was five years ago. It should be better every year. You're supposed to grow. But most of us, you know, are stuck in that little third grade desk thinking we're golden and we've been there for 15 years of our life I'm financially. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, no, it's time to if fucking you step the, it up. You have the pencil. Let's get to the big desk here and yeah. let's do some real shit. But it requires that you change the habits, you change the patterns, you change what they're doing. And so we look for simple, practical stuff um, and, and how to help people perform at their best. You asked about time management. Something that helps with time management is someone being at their absolute best. So seven and a half to eight hours of high quality sleep, 20% deep, 20% REM. You got to measure and track it and make sure you're in the, those numbers. Uh, nutrition, customized nutrition. Nowadays, you know, millionaires, billionaires, and pro athletes used to have customized nutrition plans for their specific blood type, body type, uh, you know, genome type. Nowadays, you can get access to all of that for a couple hundred bucks each, and you can have customized nutrition, the right fuel for your body. It, that's the way to do it. Um, next up, movement. Uh, the people who live the longest, cent centenarians or centarians, people who live over 100 years old, it's a gatherer and forager mindset. You're constantly going up and down and walking around and picking up stuff and setting it down. And so you got to set yourself up. I'm standing this whole time and I try to stand all day long when I'm talking to people. And so it's standing, bending over, standing up, squatting down, leaning up, doing lunges, going and talking to people. Constant perpetual motion is the key to longevity there and, and strength and endurance. Um, you get down to, uh, let's see, happiness. There's a book called The Happiness Advantage. He's broken down scientifically. Here's seven things you can do every day that guarantees you're going to have more happiness at the end of those seven days or 30 days, I'm sorry, and seven things. And so one of them is journaling three good things that happened today. Another one is a random act of kindness. Another one is volunteering for two hours a week. Another one is meditating for 10 minutes a day. Um, all these things are guaranteed scientifically to produce a happier life. Uh, peer group, picking people you know, who are... 33% of your peer group should be five, 10 steps ahead of you on the journey. 33% should be at the exact same moment. And 33% should be a step or two behind you so you can share with them and help them catch up. Creating a powerful peer group. Harvard says your peer group determines how successful, how happy, and, and how long you live. So creating a powerful peer group. All these things produce results. And coming down to, I'll throw this one here as a twist. So all those, we have a program online called The Complete Guide to Activating High Performance. Um, if you go to highperformancekw.com, you can grab it for 10 bucks and it just summarizes absolutely how to get yourself at your absolute best every single day. Let me see if I could find something real quick. Um, let's see. Good sex. Couples who have great sex, a great sex life. There was a research study done on 70,000 couples and asked them what makes a great sex life. What are the habits they did? And the ones who reported having a great sex life compared to the ones who don't, here's 13 things they did. Number one, they said, I love you every day and meant it. Number two, 
They kissed one another passionately for no reason each day. Number three, they gave surprise romantic gifts. Number four, they know what turns their partner on and off. Number five, they're physically affectionate, even in public. Number six, they keep playing together and having fun together. Number seven, they cuddle. Number eight, they make sex a priority instead of a last item on their long to-do list. And there's, there's 13 of them all together. But that concept, none of those things are rocket science. They're very simple. Simple things done consistently lead to extraordinary results. Even in relationships, you want to have a great sex life? 13 things you can do, get a great sex life. Now, there's six things couples reported. If they did these things, they had a horrible sex life. There's probably more important list to pay attention to. This is how to screw it up. Number one, spend very little time together during the typical week. Number two, become job-centered him and become child-centered her. Number three, talk mostly about their huge to-do list all the time. Number four, seem to make everything else a priority other than their relationship. Number five, drift apart and lead parallel lives. And there's six of these things, but together, there's very simple things that make it work, very simple things that totally screw it up. Crazy part is there's a research organization that did, that one was 70,000 couples. There's another group that did 30 years of research on 3,000 couples and found there's seven things, if done consistently, create a master of relationship that lasts. There's also these same seven things. If you screw them up consistently, you're considered a disaster in relationship. It completely falls apart. They could sit you in a room and let you talk to your partner for an hour. Within an hour, they can get over a 90% accurate read on if your relationship is going to last or not, depending on the ratio in which you share with each wow. other. In five minutes, they can get about 70% accuracy Wow! on if you're going to last or not as a couple. All they're judging is when you have a conflict, the ratio of positive to negative. Wow. Looks, any piece of communication, looks, gestures, words, tones, temperaments, positive to negative. If it's one to one, you're gone. You're out. If it's three to one, you're stable. Three positive to one negative, you're stable. If it's five or six to one, you're going to have a chance to do some good stuff together. So I always tell people, that's an intimate relationship with your partner. What about the relationship with yourself? What's the ratio going on between your own ears? This is a big one on performance. If you have a one-to-one, -one, one positive to one negative ratio in your own self-talk and your own between your two ears, you're fucked. If you have a negative ratio, more negative than positive, you're out of the game. If you have a three-to-one, you're stable. If you get a five or six-to-one, you're growing and you've got a chance. Now, if you're starting a business, the reality is 95% of businesses fail in the first five years, 98% fail in 10 years. If you're negative in your head, you don't have a fucking chance. If you're positive, you get yourself right, you're the happiest, healthiest, strongest, most fulfilled version of yourself, you're still up against 98% chance of losing in just 10 years but it's going to take the best version of you to have a chance at surviving in reality. Cool. Wow. Yeah, and it's all, it's always about like you, you listen to D Martini that, that, well, obviously you did, you sent it to me Yeah. when it was talking about, and it's, you know, when our voids create our value and that's really what drives us and always having those challenges and being challenged to do that kind of stuff too, is really what can create that fulfillment and be happy as well. And it's, it's just kind of interesting. I like tying into all of this too. I just had those, those, that audio going through my head with it all. Right. And, um, I guess kind of where I wanted to go with that is like with, with when we, what I perceive as like happiness now is really being challenged. And, and like you were saying is, is growing within that and accepting the challenge and, and really wanting to push through it. And I think that a while before that, I always perceived happiness of just being content and happy and cruising. But the reality is, is when we get there and we're not challenged anymore, it's not important that, that, that thing isn't important to us anymore. So really understanding to know that we got to really open that up and find the voids create our values. And then all of a sudden, whatever we feel we're lacking, even though we don't lack any of it, like you mentioned at the beginning, right? It's the real core pieces of happiness are all there for us, right? It's, it's always been there, but it's what we perceive as lacking and that really drives us. So I think that, that having that challenge with everything too is super valuable. I just, I just kind of, I don't know where that came from. I just wanted to bring that into this conversation a little bit on just realizing how important challenge can be towards being happy and, and really 
staying positive and keeping that growth because yeah. sometimes challenge we think can create that negative thought process too, right? Yeah, there's a great book to read called The Amazing Development of Men. Um, and it talks about at every stage of a man's life, there's a different thing that compels him to mm -hmm. drive forward. Uh, 13 to 30 is, is the challenge. It's a constant call for more. And no matter how many times a man gets to the peak of a mountain, they see another peak and go, I must climb that mountain. And it's the compelling. And all men have this for their whole life. Some men, it's their main driver. Some men right around 30, 35 transition to finding one thing that's worth, here's the phrase, worth investing my life into. I was like, whoa, it's a big phrase. And so they take it really fucking seriously and they're hunting for one thing that's worth investing their life into. And when they find it, their next 15 to 20 years is work, 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 breathe. Work, 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 breathe. Work, 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 breathe. Um, that happens to be my sweet spot of clients personally, one-on-one. -on -one. So I wrote an article for Entrepreneur Magazine or, or their blog, entrepreneur.com, that talks about, you know, is going all in on my business going to cost me my relationship? Like, because the worst thing that happens is you go work, 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 breathe. Work, 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 breathe. And either A, you'll end up having a heart attack because you don't take care of your physical body. B, you'll end up coming home, your kids hate you and your wife's gone. Or C, uh, you go bankrupt in the process or a combination of the three. And I just talked to a friend of mine who's a huge, very, very big name in the internet marketing space. And he had a trifecta. All three kicked him right in the nuts. Same time. He had something jack him up in his health, which, which fucked up his relationship. That fell apart, lost half his money. And then he almost went bankrupt. I was like, holy shit. And all it was, was they weren't paying attention to the little things that need to happen consistently to keep yourself at your best. And so in that window of time in that article. If you Google entrepreneur, Jerick Robbins, it'll, the article will pop up, read it. And it has tips of what to do in each category, specifically knowing your stage of life and knowing what's necessary to keep yourself at your best. Cool. And it changes. So you're spot on for, for that, that piece is in all, according to the lady who wrote the book, it's all men, but I think in all masculine energy, some mm -hmm. women have it too. Uh, but, but it, it, it's that masculine energy in this stage of life, it's compelled by the challenge. Like that is what we live for at that stage of life. And then in this next stage, it's compelled by the one thing that we think our life is worth investing into. Um, there's other stages where that all changes again and kind of fucks us all up because we think we had it yeah. and we did it. And we're so proud of ourselves for achieving this fucking thing. And then one day we wake up and go, yeah. what's it? <laughs> yeah. Fucks up the whole game. <laughs> they call that yeah. a midlife crisis here in the U S and you, Canada where you're just, you know, you're like, ah, oh, fuck 40, 30 years of my life. Was that worth anything? Does anyone even care? And you're like, ah, shit. you question everything. But the beautiful part is you six months or six years later, you pop out of the tunnel after questioning everything and you realize, ah, this is the one thing I'm interested in making my life about from this day forward. The one gift I want to share with everyone around me. You can identify people who are at this stage in their seventies, you know, 60s, seventies, eighties, because that's the only thing they ever want to fucking talk about. They only talk about one thing. And they're normally nonstop talking about the same fucking thing. <laughs> you go see grandpa and he's like, did I tell you that story? You're like, yes, grandpa. You told me the story 272 fucking times when I was a kid. Like, that's the one thing. <laughs> You're like, grandpa, want to talk about art? He's like, nope. <laughs> no interest. I love it. <clears throat> Just because it's not his one thing. How you identify him at a, at a family reunion, they're either in the middle of the room sharing their one thing lit up like a Christmas tree or they're in the corner hunched over by themselves, not saying a thing to anyone because they feel like their one thing is not valued in this room. Wow. That's a later stage of life. So the book, it's amazing development of men, lady named Alison Armstrong, wonderful insight for, for men and women to understand what men go through at every stage and what they're ready for, for a plug for any ladies listening. The reason this would be important if you're dating men, um, you could identify language patterns that within two minutes, you'll understand what they're ready for in a relationship and what they're not. The worst thing that happens for a woman is at a certain stage, a man is either believes you're supposed to build the kingdom first and then find someone to share it with or find someone to build it together with. What really fucks up and pisses off women 
is when a man has the philosophy of I'll build it first and then share it. So they build it with her for 10 years. And once it's ready, they kick her out and find the person to share it with. That significantly pisses <laughs> off women. I bet. Yeah. Because yeah. they thought they were the one and they're like, no, you were the one to build with. Now I'm going to go find the one to share it with. And the phrase they use is you wasted my best years. And, and that's a, that's a, finish them move from <laughs> men, men don't know why she wants to behead you after 10 years that's why um so little little insights for men and women it's a great thing to study it's a great thing to know and it, it helps understand what you're ready for what to look for in partnership or relationship um it's not just men and women i had a dude pull me aside one time after teaching that on a cruise and he, he, I was teaching the woman's path. There's a whole other woman's path too. And he was like, listen, I do not fucking relate to that men's path, but I sure as fuck relate to stage two on that woman's path. Okay. <laughs> I was like, fuck. Okay. It's not yeah. a man. It's not a gender thing. It's, yeah. it's an energy thing, I guess. Uh, he, he was gay and he was totally a temptress. He says, and I was like, cool. <laughs> I'm proud of you, bro. Like, that's awesome. <laughs> Work that shit. Um, so, so there's a woman's path too. And it's really important to know what women are ready for at each stage as well and how to communicate effectively with them. Interesting. Dude, that's super interesting. And I was not excited. I'm so grateful that we had this conversation. Like we yeah, went into so many different Thanks. things that I didn't, uh, and so many paths to go down now and so many reasons, dude, like this is amazing, man. Thank you. Yeah. Hopefully this is useful no, every to everyone tuning in. We, we took a lot of different paths. Yeah, around totally. this no, this is amazing. Like, thank you so much for, for taking the time to come out and, and share and, Man, I I got a ton of things that I now when I go like at books, I got everything on yeah, for I'm everyone listening. All those books. Yeah, we got it all down. This is amazing, dude. For for everyone listening right now, if they want to see more of you, where where do you where would you like to direct them? Uh, if we want to send them over, do you want to send them to your website or social media or all of it? Where where should they find you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, two two or three places. I would say come okay. to jerickrobbins.com, just my main website. Yep. You guys can throw that in the show notes. Um people are going to try to guess it, just Google it. And hopefully this mug will show up. And if it is <laughs> click that one, um, if it doesn't try it again, <laughs> uh, and then find me on Instagram. I chat with people all day long on Instagram. Um, anytime I'm between interviews or coaching sessions, I'm normally just chatting away with people trying to help them. It's one of my favorite things. Um, uh, you know, we charge a significant amount for one-on-one -on -one coaching and we have other businesses that generate all our income, but it allows me to free, free up time that I can spend, you know, just the other day helping a 12 year old girl, in India, figure out how to go to her parents and express that she wants to be a pilot instead of an engineer. And they want her to be an engineer. That's a big yeah. fucking deal in India. So we were creating a strategy of how she could effectively communicate wow. with that with her parents. And so I spend my spare time doing stuff like that. And, you know, anyone in here, I'd be happy to help if they have big questions or stuff they're trying to solve. Um, but, but come find me on Instagram if you want to chat like that. Check out my website if you want to know our business and what we're up to in that oh, sense. Cool, man. Dude, well, thank you so much again. Really appreciate you, you coming out. And again, for all of you guys, check out jerickrobbins.com. Check him out on Instagram. And uh, hopefully we'll have you back out again and chat again. But thank you so much for popping yeah. out, brother. Appreciate you. you. Yeah, thank you all. Hopefully your window's okay. We got to get a fix still. <laughs> so, awesome. Yeah. Board that shit up. Watch out for any guys with rocks. Yeah. Cool.